think we're now we're now live. Emily will correct me if we're wrong, and I'm just talking to myself. But um, assuming we are, welcome. Thanks for, for joining us on this wet and windy um, Thursday morning. We could think of no better way to um, brighten your January lockdown blues than a talk about insurance law. So um, thanks very much for for logging on. Um, as you know, we're obviously here to talk about the the very recent Supreme Court decision in the SCA um, business interruption insurance test case, which I'm sure you've all diligently read cover to cover. Um, we're going to try and uh, take on a whistle-stop tour through the, the key points that came out of it, how the Supreme Court approached it, um, and where it matters, how the Supreme Court differed from the, the divisional court's judgment at first instance. Uh, and then we'll look at the ramifications of, of the, um, the decision for, for policyholders more generally, and where there might still be a few areas um, that are ripe for, for litigation in the future. Um, with me today are Georgie Thompson and Dan Saul, um, two of the most promising junior tenants in our, our commercial and chancery department. Um, between the three of us, we're going to take you through the key bits of the judgment. Um, I'm going to discuss disease clauses um, uh, and in particular, the all-important treatment of causation by the Supreme Court in the context of those clauses. Um, Georgie is then going to talk about prevention of access clauses and hybrid clauses and how the court approached um, those particular um, types of, of bolt on cover. Uh, and then Dan is going to talk about the quantum mechanisms and in particular trends clauses and the, the court's treatment of um, pre-trigger losses. Um, by way of disclaimer, if you hear the odd bit of yapping while I'm talking, it's not me getting overexcited about insurance law, it's the young Labrador sat next to me um, who's very excitable this morning because there are some workmen in my house and he's absolutely adamant that he needs to supervise them, but um, hopefully he'll behave himself for, for the duration. Um, so let's get, get stuck into it. The, the key point you'll all know is that it was a win for policyholders, a big win for policyholders. They did quite well in the divisional court, but they did even better uh, in the Supreme Court. And some of the insurer's arguments were shown to be um, really quite distasteful and brazen attempts to defeat cover. Um, and the, the almost um, incredulity of that position at its most extreme um, was, was really met by the Supreme Court's retort that no reasonable reader of these policies would see it that way, because essentially the net effect of the insurer's most adventurous arguments would be to render uh, the, the relevant aspects of cover completely illusory in circumstances where the reasonable reader would naturally have expected the policies to have responded. So it, it is a, a, a victory for common sense and it does reflect the way um, a reasonable person would, would read these policies at a high level of generality. And insurance law is one of those areas where it's quite easy to get lost in, in technical linguistic arguments, but the the Supreme Court repeatedly emphasised in its judgment that where one of the parties is a, a small or, or medium sized enterprise, um, those arguments, those technical linguistic arguments will not wash unless they ultimately accord with the meaning and the purpose that can reasonably be attributed um, to the parties uh, in the circumstances in which the policy was, was brought into being. That, that's the thing that I really take away from it. The Supreme Court is very keen to, to, to wield the tools at its disposal to give effect um, to those reasonable expectations of parties of this particular nature, small and medium sized enterprises. Um, but the judgment is, is especially interesting on several particular fronts, some of which might extend beyond the realms of insurance law altogether. Um, so let's begin with, with disease clauses. Um, what are they? It's essentially, they're a clause which responds to business interruption sustained following the occurrence of a specified disease within a set distance of the insured's premises. And in most cases, in most of the policies considered in this case, that radius was 25 miles. We we're looking to see um, uh, uh, at least one case of the disease occurring within that 25 mile radius. Now, there are two central points that, that both the Divisional Court and the Supreme Court grappled with. The first is on the proper construction of these policies, what was the insured peril? And the second is what causal relationship between the insured peril and the interruption of the business had to be established in order to trigger cover. And those points were absolutely central because at the heart of the insurer's case was an argument uh, as adventurous uh, as it was simple. 
the insurers argued that the insured peril was only the occurrence of the virus within that specified radius, so 25 miles in most cases. And but for those cases within that 25 mile radius, the policyholder would still have suffered the same losses, the same interruption to their business, because there were so many cases beyond that 25 mile radius, thousands of them um, across the country, across the world. And in response to those cases beyond that 25 mile radius, the insurer said, well, the government would undoubtedly have responded in the same way by imposing national lockdown restrictions, which would, of course, have interfered with the policyholder's business. So it follows, said the insurers, that the cases within the 25 mile radius cannot be said to have caused the interruption to the policyholder's business, because that interruption would have happened even if there had been no cases within that 25 mile radius. It would have happened because there were so many cases beyond that 25 mile radius. Now, I, I say that's an adventurous argument because it doesn't take five Supreme Court justices to recognize that the, the obvious implication which has to be accepted if that argument is true, is that despite the policy expressly listing a variety of highly contagious diseases, and despite it being the contagious nature of those diseases and their propensity to spread far and wide, which is likely to bring about restrictions interfering with the business. Despite those two things, the insurers say the policy only responds if the impact of that disease was so concentrated within a 25 mile radius and comparatively absent uh, outside that 25 mile radius that the but for causation mechanism um, would, would be satisfied. It would reach the conclusion that those cases within the 25 mile radius cause the restrictions. Now that, that conclusion would, I think on any of you, come as, as quite a surprise to the policyholder who has paid uh, uh, often some quite substantial premiums to bolt this cover onto their policy. Now, the divisional court dealt with that, that argument, those two twin points, what's the insured peril and what's the causal relationship, in quite an interesting way. They said the many thousands of uh, COVID infections should be viewed as a single indivisible cause and that the insured peril was not simply those cases within the 25 mile radius, but the COVID-19 pandemic itself, the whole thing. Now, in that fell swoop, the divisional court overcame the insurer's causation argument because nobody could deny that the pandemic caused the lockdown and the lockdown caused the business interruption. So if the insured peril is the pandemic and you can't distinguish particular cases from one another, they're all to be viewed as one indivisible cause, uh, then the causation argument collapses. It becomes a very simple cause, causal, uh, causal chain. Uh, and provided that a case had arisen within the 25 mile radius, then the policy would respond. Now, the Supreme Court took a different route to the same ultimate destination. It felt unable to treat the pandemic itself as the insured peril. And it felt unable to do that because of the clear language in the policies themselves. Uh, and it could not, by a faithful application of the, the well-established um, principles of construction, it couldn't resist the conclusion that the insured peril was the existence of a case of the disease within 25 miles. Um, as much as it might like to uh, uh, use the, the divisional court's reasoning to reach that ultimate conclusion, it said, well, that, that just does too much violence to the language that the parties have actually used. Uh, and by um, upholding that finding, they would in turn do violence to those well-established principles of, of construction, um, which when bent or misshapen lose that predictability, which is so important to the parties who, who wrote the words in the first place. So the Supreme Court was keen to um, uh, adopt a much more necessarily literal but faithful um, approach to construction, faithful to the language that the parties actually used. It was unwilling to, to thrust upon them a meaning that really doesn't, really isn't capable of sitting with the, the actual language of the policies. That's a good thing. The Supreme Court is, is defending the integrity of the, the construction principles in general uh, and allowing parties a bit of confidence in, in um, predicting how those principles will be applied in the future. But of course, that conclusion in the Supreme Court left alive the insurer's causation argument, because if the insured peril is only those cases within the 25 mile radius, uh, then the but-for test would, would pose a serious problem because there's no way that um, 
it is satisfied on that basis. Now, this is where it gets particularly uh, interesting. The Supreme Court got stuck into the meaning of proximate cause and proximate cause has been the language used to, to um, approach causation in insurance law for a very long time. It derives from um, marine insurance, but it, it applies across the, the board. Now, uh, when Lords Leggett and Lord Hamden began this section of their, their judgment, they repeated an observation of Lord Sumner over 100 years ago, and he said, it would be better for a little plain English in this area. Um, ironically, in the very next breath, Lords Leggett and Lord Hamblin begin citing, uh, in Latin, Sir Francis Bacon's first maxim of the law from 1596, so not a lot of plain English there. Next, they turn to explore the notion of efficient causation developed by the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle. So not a great start in terms of plain English um, by the Supreme Court, but they did work their way around um, to, to a bit of common sense and some very clear statements of principle. And what they effectively said was that while the but for approach to causation would often be appropriate, it cannot always be so. And whether it would in any particular case be appropriate to employ but for causation depended on the proper interpretation of the policy. And in particular, it depended upon the background knowledge that's attributable to the parties as part of the matrix of fact against which that exercise of construction takes place. Uh, and um, it, it was part of that background matrix of fact that was so important in, in warranting a departure from but for causation in this case. Now the court attached real importance to the fact that the parties could be presumed to know that some infectious diseases could spread rapidly, wild, widely uh, and unpredictably. And it is highly likely that an outbreak of such a disease would comprise cases both inside and outside the radius, and that measures taken by a public authority would be in response to the outbreak as a whole. The public authority is not going to be at all interested in just the cases within that 25 mile radius. It's going to be reacting to the pandemic uh, as a whole and to the risk that it spreads far and wide as, as it obviously has done. Now, once you uh, attribute to the parties that background knowledge, it would be contrary to the commercial intent of the policy to treat uninsured cases occurring outside the 25 mile radius as depriving the policyholder of an indemnity in respect of the cases occurring within it. And that is effectively what the insurers were trying to do. They were relying upon uh, the sheer volume of cases outside uh, the, the radius to, to break the causal link. To, to defeat the proposition that the cases within it precipitated a national lockdown and a restriction to the policy elders' business. Now, they did, the, the, the Supreme Court did agree with the insurer's um, argument that, uh, and to quote the, the Supreme Court, in the vast majority of insurance cases, indeed in the vast majority of cases in any field of law or ordinary life, if event Y would still have occurred anyway, irrespective of the occurrence of a prior event X, then X cannot be said to have caused Y. In plain English, that means in the vast majority of cases in insurance law or anything else, but for causation still applies. It is still a big deal, but it is not absolute and it can, where the, lang the language of the contract requires, be departed from. That, that um, in my view, is the, the single most important thing that, that comes from this judgment, the Supreme Court's recognition that the true meaning and purpose of the contract can require a departure from the application of but for causation. Now that, that brings me to the, the final um, observation I'm going to make. Um, as contract lawyers or commercial lawyers, we're all very familiar with the, the um, Hadley and Baxendale approach to remoteness of loss in breach of contract claims. Um, and those who spend quite a bit of time in that area will, will also be familiar with the, the more recent notion of assumption of responsibility um, in the context of remoteness of loss. Now that language, assumption of responsibility, has its origins in, in tortious liability for pure economic loss, but it also found voice in the rules of remoteness of loss for breach of contract claims, um, at least as early as Lord Hoffman's speech in the Achilles in 2008. It effectively asked, when you're looking uh, at which, which losses the party in breach is liable to, to pay damages for, it asked, well, which losses did they assume responsibility for? And the answer to that question is dictated by a true construction of the contract. 
against the matrix of admissible fact. Um, now, that's, that's not the question that arose in, in this case. There was no question of remoteness of loss. There was no question of, of damages or of even breach. The question was, what, what is the obligation upon insurers in the first place? When are they obliged to cover? There's no, no allegation that they are yet in breach. We're simply working out the logically prior question of what is their obligation in the first place. But, but I think there are real parallels there between the approach the court has taken to that question here and the approach it has begun to take to the assumption of responsibility in breach of contract claims elsewhere. Um, now, when asking in this case whether the policies responded to these circumstances, the court's approach is really governed top to bottom by its construction of the contract. The construction of the contract told the court in which circumstances the insurer assumed responsibility to cover the policyholders' losses. Uh, and it, it did that by looking at the contract in its full matrix of fact, in exactly the same way as the court looks or, or, or approaches the question of assumption of responsibility in the breach of contract case. It looks at the contract in its full factual matrix. So I suspect that beneath this case, uh, and at the root of many others, lies this unifying concept um, of assumption of responsibility. At the heart of that issue is the all-important question, what did the parties intend? And the answer to that lies in the true construction of the language they used against the background that they knew, mindful of who they are. They are, in this case, small, medium-sized enterprises. They are not, to borrow the Supreme Court's language, uh, pedantic insurance lawyers who will pour over um, every clause and every comma. Now, the man who drew um, attention to, to both of those issues in, in the decided cases, namely the, the proper approach um, to construction and the role of assumption of responsibility in, in recoverable loss, was Lord Hoffman. Everybody knows his infamous construction decision in, in the West Bromwich Building Society case, but it was also Lord Hoffman's speech in the Achilles in 2008 that brought that language, that approach, um, into assumption of responsibility in, in remoteness of loss. Um, so I uh, for my part, I suspect we still see his hand at work here as the implications of his enormous contributions to the law continue to permeate um, through areas far and wide, um, certainly more than 25 miles from, from where Lord Hoffman first started. So th those are the, the central points I'd invite you to take away from the treatment of disease clauses. Construction governed the answer, but the Supreme Court did it in a different way. They were more faithful to the language that defined the insured peril, but they used the, the totality of the, the contract against its um, admissible matrix of fact to disapply bit for, but for causation and to reach a result that accorded with the expectations of the parties when they entered into the, the policy in the first place. So I hope that's of some use to you. Um, I'm going to uh, mute myself now and um, try and placate the dog while I pass over to, to Georgie, who's going to take you through hybrid clauses and prevention of access clauses. Thanks, Nick. Um, as Nick mentioned, um, I'm going to be talking about prevention of access and hybrid clauses. Now, in relation to hybrid clauses, those are clauses which have an element of the disease clauses, which Nick has already taken you through, in that one element of the insured peril was the occurrence of a notifiable disease, which then causes the prevention of access to the business. I'll also be talking briefly about um, causation to the extent that it applies to prevention of access and hybrid clauses. Now, the approach of the parties to this case um, at first instance was that all parties legal representatives sought declarations as to the construction of a cross section of uh, sample policy clauses that were found within policies of insurance uh, with eight different insurers. Now, by the time that this was appealed to the Supreme Court, there were six different clauses from three different insurers, um, which were assessed by the Supreme Court under the heading of prevention of access and hybrid clauses. And the approach that the Supreme Court took in relation to those six clauses was to break them down into discrete elements so as to ascertain the meaning of the clause as a whole. And the Supreme Court ultimately held in relation to the construction of the prevention of access and hybrid clauses that only if all of those elements were satisfied would an indemnity be triggered such that the insurer would be required to uh, pay out to the policyholder under the policy of insurance. 
So what I propose to do is essentially look at the Supreme Court treatment, the Supreme Court's treatment of those discrete um, elements um, and go into a little bit more detail uh, where, where necessary and where I think um, the points of interest most lie. Um, two of those points are the force of law points and the inability to use elements and I'll elaborate on those um, further as we go through. So the first element uh, is the disease element and um, there's not really much to say on this um, in terms of what I could add to Nick's discussion. Uh, the disease element of the hybrid clauses uh, were very similar to those of the pure disease clauses which Nick has already discussed. Um, Interestingly, in relation to some of the hybrid clauses, um, you may have um, remembered from Nick's talk that there was, um, in terms of disease clauses, a, a geographical limitation on um, the, the radius by which an area could be affected by a, a notifiable disease. Now, in some cases, in relation to the hybrid clauses, um, I think there were three particular clauses um, that were affected. There, were, there was no geographical scope, so no one mile radius, no 25 mile, mile, mile radius. And what the Supreme Court, um, or what the insurers sought to argue before the Supreme Court, was that the use of the word occurrence in terms of the occurrence of a notifiable disease, um, this should be construed so as to impose some form of limitation, albeit that there was no express geographical limitation um, on the scope of cover under those clauses. And the insurers argued that the word occurrence should be construed to be meaning a, school, a small scale outbreak or a local outbreak. Um, the Supreme Court uh, declined to follow that construction um, and refused to interpret those clauses with no ge geographical lim limitation um, in that way. Essentially, they, the Supreme Court said that had the insurers intended to um, impose a geographical scope, then they would have expressly done so. So that's a fairly broad interpretation of those clauses, albeit a justifiable one. Um, but it does serve as a warning to insurers going forward to if they are they do intend to uh, narrow the scope and limit the scope, um, uh, then to do so expressly um, by reference to a geographical radius. The next element uh, which was considered by the Supreme Court under this heading was what I uh, mentioned earlier is the force of law point. Now, at first instance, the divisional court in this case held that the words restrictions imposed meant a restriction which was expressed in mandatory terms and of which had force of law. Now, the FCA appealed to the Supreme Court on this point, and their contention ultimately was that they wanted cover to be triggered before the restrictions were imposed by the government by way of the 26th of March regulations when um, the restrictions which we are all now familiar with came into effect by way of um, force of law. The FCA wanted to um, put forward the contention that the restrictions came into effect by what it termed as general measures and special measures, and I'm sure we're all familiar with those. So the general measures were the Prime Minister's direction that we were to stay at home, which uh, came into, well, where the Prime Minister mentioned that on the 16th of March. And the special measures were um, things such as that the schools were to close on the 18th of March, and then businesses were to close tonight, um, that being tonight on the 20th of March. And what the FCA were arguing on this point um, before the Supreme Court was that they were suggesting that the divisional court's approach was too narrow and that if you were to adopt the divisional court's approach in requiring a restriction imposed as a restriction which had the force of law behind it, then this would require policyholders to analyse the legality of an instruction from a public authority or from the Prime Minister before they would know whether or not they were actually going to be indemnified under their policy of insurance. And the FCA argued that before the Supreme Court that this was an uncommercial and unrealistic approach to take. The Supreme Court agreed with that and the Supreme Court ultimately held in relation to this that a restriction need not have the force of law before it can fall within the, the remit of a restriction being imposed. Um, applying the usual principles of contractual construction, the Supreme Court said that a reasonable policyholder would understand the word imposed as being um, something which is condition, conditional upon the existence or immediate prospect of having a, a legal basis behind it. But interestingly, the Supreme Court stopped short of deciding at exactly what date those restrictions imposed um, under the were effectively imposed pursuant to the clauses which they examined. Um, 
The point about the general and the specific restrictions which were cited by the FCA um, in, in terms of their argument on appeal was left over for further argument. So the Supreme Court essentially didn't determine when they construed uh, those sample clauses. They said ultimately the restriction doesn't need to be mandatory and backed by a force of law. Um, but they didn't say whether or not uh, in their construction that the specific and the general measures, which were um, essentially given by the prime minister in his addresses to the public, um, fell within the scope of their construction. What the Supreme Court did indicate was that the prime minister's statement that was given on the 20th of March, where he said that businesses must close tonight, they said that that was capable of falling within the definition of their definition of restrictions imposed, in spite of the fact that um, a direction that businesses must close tonight had no specified consequences if those businesses didn't close tonight. But short of this, the Supreme Court didn't uh, decide the issue of whether the general or specific measures um, um, fell within their construction of restrictions imposed. So the practical consequence of this is going forward and pending either further argument by the parties or um, an agreement between the parties as to the construction of um, the restrictions imposed element of those clauses is the impact of these rolling lockdowns that we seem to be seeing at the moment, um, which the government is imposing. Um, so if we come out of um, lockdown as we are now in and go back into a tiered system, what impact will that have on terms of uh, measures coming from local councils or from uh, local uh, leaders essentially requiring businesses to close even though um, they may not have the force of law behind them uh, when those directions are given. So it would be open to insurers and businesses going forward when negotiating new contracts of insurance to make it explicit what would trigger a right to an indemnity. So, for example, if the prime minister says that you have to close, that that would be sufficient to trigger cover or vice versa. Um, it would be open to the insurers going forward to specify that a right to an indemnity will only arise if um, a restriction is backed by the force of law. So turning to another element which was examined uh, by the Supreme Court, and this is essentially the nature of the restriction uh, which is being imposed. Um, an, an interesting point was considered under this element in that whether the restriction which was being imposed was what it was sufficient for it to be directed at uh, the public at large as the insurers were contending, or whether the restriction needed to be directed primarily and solely at uh, the insured business. The divisional court um, at first instance held that the restrictions imposed did not need to be aimed exclusively at the business and it was sufficient for policy to be uh, the, the, the right to indemnity to be triggered if the restrictions were imposed on the public at large. Now on appeal the insurers did raise some interesting and in my view sensible arguments on this point. They said that business insurance cover is provided as an add-on to property cover, such that the clause, uh, the hybrid clauses and the prevention of access clauses, are directed at the premises of the insured and not the customers of the insured and the use of the premises by the customers. Um, the insurers also argued that the clauses were never aimed um, uh, on a sensible uh, reading at the inability to use the premises um, resulting from restrictions to the public at large. However, the Supreme Court didn't agree with the insurers on this point. Uh, the court noted in fairly broad terms that the, res the words restrictions imposed were general and unqualified, such that a reading uh, that the insurers were contending for and suggesting that the restrictions must be directly imposed um, on the insured business couldn't be justified. Turning to um, another element considered by the uh, Supreme Court, and this was the construction of the words inability to use in terms of inability to use the insured premises. Um, there was a requirement, an express requirement in most of the um, hybrid clauses which were examined that the policyholder must be unable to use the premises due to the restrictions imposed. Now, the question is, what constitutes an inability to use? The divisional court at first instance held that an inability to use meant a complete inability to use. Um, the FCA then appealed that to the Supreme Court and they said that an inability to use the premises would be satisfied where a policyholder is able to demonstrate that they're unable to use their premises for its ordinary purposes. Um, they essentially argued that on appeal that inability doesn't 
denote uh, the extent to which the policyholder lacks the inability to use the premises. Now, the Supreme Court, in considering this question, held that whilst it agreed with the insurers in that a complete inability had to be established rather than an impairment or a hindrance, the Supreme Court went on to hold that the language of the clause doesn't require there to be a complete inability to use the premises for all purposes, such that the requirement for, of an inability to use would be satisfied where a policyholder is unable to use either a discrete part of its premises for part of its business activities or unable to carry out a discrete part of its business activities. So the examples given in the Supreme Court's judgment were, for example, in terms of a discrete part of the business premises, um, would be a restaurant with dine-in facilities. Obviously, that part of the business can't be used uh, for the public to accept walk-ins. And then in terms of a discrete part of the business activities, um, the Supreme Court gave the example of a bookshop um, where the bookshop was still able to trade online. However, it wasn't able to um, allow customers into the shop and therefore its walk-in sales would have dropped. So in relation to this, what, do, what it does mean for insurance policies going forward is that they will have to, insurers will, if they intend to restrict the scope of cover, have to be more explicit as to whether an inability to use constitutes a total closure of the business or whether it's sufficient for a discrete part of the business premises, all the business activities to be um, uh, impaired such that a policy would be triggered. And if that is the case, then insurers will need to be clear on to what extent that uh, impairment um, is going to be defined. Would you define it uh, by way of an activity, for example, um, are you unable to sell to customers in your shop as opposed to selling to them online? Or would you determine it in terms of a percentage um, of the business activities which have been prevented by restrictions? So that's something which the um, insurers going forward will need to consider. Now, in relation to another element, which was the prevention of access, there was only one pure prevention of access clause assessed by the Supreme Court. Um, an impure prevention of access, I mean, it didn't have a disease element attached onto it. And the Supreme Court interpreted this in the same or the similar manner as they did with the inability to use in that um, it was sufficient uh, that the policyholder was unable to access part of their business premises to carry out their usual business activities. Um, so again, going forwards, um, if insurers do intend to restrict the scope of their cover, then they will need to be more explicit um, in defining if um, there is a prevention of access clause, whether it extends to the entire premises or whether it's sufficient that part of the premises um, is uh, the policyholder is prevented from accessing it. Um, another element uh, considered by the Supreme Court was the meaning of the word interruption. The, the, the divisional court held at first instance that in interruption, the word interruption meant business interruption generally and included interference or disruption. So not just a complete cessation of business activities. The insurers um, understandably uh, appealed to the Supreme Court on this point, and they argued that interruption naturally meant stop or break and that that was a different uh, meaning to interference, which means something that cannot be carried on properly. And the significance of this was ultimately that the, that the insurers were seemingly trying to avoid having to pay out under policies of insurance between um, around August and October of last year, um, after the first nation national lockdown was eased. Um, and a lot of businesses were not necessarily stopped from carrying on business completely, but were significantly hindered um, in that they could only accept a limited number of customers due to social distancing, etc. However, the Supreme Court quite swiftly rejected the insurance arguments on the meaning of interruption. And they said that the meaning of interruption is quite capable of encompassing an interference or disruption, which does not bring about a complete cessation of business activities. So those were the discrete elements which were examined uh, by the Supreme Court. And ultimately, although it turns on a question of construction, what the Supreme Court suggested was that looking at those, uh, the clause as a whole by breaking down those elements, only if all of those elements are satisfied will uh, cover be triggered um, under the policy. So turning then uh, very briefly to the question of causation insofar as it relates to hybrid and prevention of access clauses. 
Um, I know that Nick has already discussed the question of causation, but the differing factor in relation to the prevention of access and hybrid clauses was that unlike the disease clauses, the hybrid and the prevention of access clauses specified more than one condition which must be satisfied in order to establish that the business interruption had been caused by the insured peril. And so what the Supreme Court did was to break down the wording of those clauses um, and they um, assessed it by way of uh, what they called causal sequencing. And so taking, for example, um, a hybrid clause with many elements, as the Supreme Court called it, called it they essentially suggested that um, A would be an occurrence of a notifiable disease, which causes B, restrictions imposed by a public authority, which causes C, an inability to use the insured premises, which D, causes an interruption to a policyholder's business activities. Now, looking at this as a matter of construction, as Nick has already discussed, the differing factor here is that each element from A to D narrows the consequences for which the policyholder is entitled to an indemnity. And interestingly, the Supreme Court, in looking at causation in relation to the hybrid and prevention of access clauses, disagreed with both the approach of the divisional court at first instance and the alternative approach which was put forward by the insurers on appeal. Very briefly, what the divisional court did was apply the but for test in saying that uh, by asking what the position would have been had the insured business um, had none of the elements in the causal sequence occurred. And the Supreme Court said that that was the wrong approach to take. And the alternative approach put forward by the way of ins by, by the insurers rather tentative to, tentatively, I would suggest, is that they said that the core principle of the insured peril in this context was the restrictions being imposed by the public authority and therefore we should focus on that as being the the main cause when assessing causation um, and the supreme court essentially said that to do that would be contrary to what the insurers had actually agreed to provide in that it would ignore one or more of the elements within that causal sequence so ultimately the supreme court came up with its own approach to causation in relation to the hybrid and prevention of access clauses and they held that the clauses will indemnify the policyholder against the risk of all of the elements so all of the elements from a to d of the insured peril acting in causal combination which was the the similar factor with the disease clauses in terms of that approach to cause business interruption loss um, so just looking very briefly at the effect of this it is quite interesting in terms of how the supreme court allowed their approach to causation to influence their approach to construction to influence their approach to causation in that they were reading the specific elements as they did in terms of construction of the clauses as narrowing the scope of the causal consequences um, of the the insured peril um, so i hope that's been of some assistance um, and i'm going to pass over to dan now who's going to discuss trends and trigger clauses thanks georgie so once the insured peril has been properly defined and once it's held to have caused the business interruption, the final question is how do we value and calculate the loss that the policy holder has suffered as a result of that business interruption because that's what the insurer has agreed, agreed to indemnify. So the usual method, the, the, the basic standard method is to use the performance of the policy holder during a comparative period, which is often uh, about one year before the uh, period of one year up until the insured peril occurs and use that to compare and estimate what the uh, policyholders business's turnover would likely have been during the indemnity period. Uh, they'll also calculate a, a gross profit margin which can be applied uh, to the estimated turnover. That gives a, a broad and quite vague estimate of what the turnover will likely be and so the trends clauses operate to allow uh, certain factors and trends to be taken into account when trying to assess what the business's turnover would likely be during the indemnity period. So, for example, if there is a, a there's long term trends such as the business steadily declining or or steadily rising, then that trend can be taken into account when assessing what the turnover would likely be during the indemnity period. And also more specific factors can be taken into account too. The example used by the Supreme Court was that of a restaurant, which is forced to close because of the national restrictions, but also uh, had a famous chef working 
who was due to leave about the same time as the lockdown started. Now, the, the trends clauses allow that factor to be taken into account. So in the indemnity period, the restaurant's business would likely have fallen as a result of their famous chef leaving, uh, and that can be factored in. So put simply, really, the trends clauses call for an inquiry into the, what the financial results of the business would have been had the insured peril not occurred. We've just heard that the court uh, rejected the but for causation in relation to examining whether the insured peril caused the business interruption. But when looking at the trends clauses, the words of the trends clauses themselves require an analysis of, of but for causation. So what would the financial results of the business be but for the insured peril? So uh, you can probably guess what the insurer's argument was on this point. Uh, as we've heard, the insured peril was defined as the occurrence of cases of COVID within the 25 mile radius or the stipulated radius. And the insurer said that the trends clause should take into account uh, what would the, what the business's performance would have been had the insured peril not occurred. So had there been no cases of COVID within the 25 mile radius, but assuming that the pandemic had still raged outside of the 25 mile radius uh, throughout the rest of the country. Now, of course, had that been the case, the national restrictions would still likely have been imposed uh, because of COVID being everywhere else. And if that is the case, then the business would likely have suffered the same losses uh, and the same business interruption because of the national restrictions. So this was another way that the insurers were trying to argue that effectively, although in principle, uh, the insurance policy provided cover for business interruption caused by COVID or, or prevention of access. In fact, when we get down to quantifying the loss suffered, that cover is actually wholly illusory because the, stuff, the losses would have been suffered in any event uh, because of the cases of COVID outside of the 25 mile radius and the responses of the government to that. So as you can imagine, the court um, was not overly impressed by this argument, but the insurers did have an authority to rely on. And that's the case uh, known as the Orient Express. Now that's the only reported case really with uh, vaguely similar facts or similar scenario. And that case concerned the business interruption insurance policy held by a hotel in New Orleans, uh, which suffered damage as a result of hurricanes Katrina and Rita in 2005. That policy contained, contained a trends clause similar to the one in issue before the Supreme Court. And in that case, the insurer essentially argued that the damage uh, defined under the policy that had to be stripped out in the application of the trends clause was the physical damage caused to the hotel, not the hurricane itself. And so when estimating what the hotel's likely performance would have been during the indemnity period, one would have to assume that the hurricane still occurred and devastated the city, but where the hotel itself remained completely unharmed. Of course, in that case, the hotel would have had no customers whatsoever because no one wants to stay in the middle of New Orleans once it had been completely devastated. So that, Similar arguments are raised there to, to, to what the insurers were arguing in front of the Supreme Court. And in that case, actually, it, it went first to, our, to an arbitral tribunal, uh, which agreed with the insurers. It was then appealed to the High Court. And again, uh, judgment, judgment was given in favour of the insurers. So that's a pretty strong authority for the insurers to rely on uh, in favour of their argument. And there's a further reason why that case could have been particularly persuasive to this particular Supreme Court. And that's because two of the Lords who were sitting in the Supreme Court on this appeal had been directly involved in deciding the Orient Express. So Sir George Legat QC, as he then was, sat on the arbitral tribunal, which decided uh, the Orient Express. And then it was uh, Mr. Justice Hamblin, as he then was, who decided the appeal in the High Court. So the insurers were making their arguments based on authority, on an, on an authority which supported their case and in front of two uh, Supreme Court justices who had made that decision. So they perhaps felt uh, somewhat confident. But uh, and it, it's interesting that Lord Leggett and Hamblin were the ones who jointly wrote the judgment and uh, eventually had to overrule themselves their own decision because the Supreme Court disagreed uh, with the insurer's argument. 
Now, the divisional court got around this argument by saying uh, that the, the, the insured peril was the entire COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so on that basis, looking at what the, the insured's business performance would have been during the indemnity period, you have to strip out the insured peril. The insured peril is the whole COVID-19 pandemic. And so all of the lockdown restrictions and everything else gets stripped out uh, and the, the insurer's argument falls away. But here, because the Supreme Court had decided that these, the insured peril was the occurrences of COVID-19 within the 25 mile radius, uh, then the, the, the argument had to be met. And the way that the Supreme Court did it uh, was they construed the, the clause, the trends clauses to require an inquiry into the policyholders likely performance, but for the insured peril and circumstances arising out of the same underlying or originating cause. So they were talking about the COVID-19 pandemic being the same underlying and originating cause. Uh, so the, the Supreme Court held that the same result really as the divisional court is that all of the effects of COVID-19 have to be stripped out when applying the trends clause. So how did the Supreme Court reach that conclusion? Well, they started by setting out a few preliminary points uh, which is essentially the observation that the trends clauses are part of the quantification machinery in the policies. They're not designed to limit the cover given by the insuring clauses, which have been covered by Nick and Georgie. Uh, the insuring clause and the trends clause should be interpreted and construed consistently with each other and not contradict each other. And that thirdly, that means that the trends clauses should be should not be construed to cut down and essentially defeat the cover that was granted by the insuring clause. So uh, uh, that led to the conclusion that it couldn't have been intended that the trends clause would have cut down the cover granted by the insuring clauses by saying, yes, uh, cover is given for when a notifiable disease comes within 25 miles of your uh, business. But when we look at what loss you suffered was, we're going to strip out everything that actually interrupted your business uh, so that effectively your cover is uh, pretty much worthless. Uh, so the, the Supreme Court clearly not happy with those arguments uh, and made its decision otherwise. A couple of other things that the Supreme Court looked at was the history of trends clauses, uh, which they considered supported their conclusion that they're designed to take into account factors wholly unrelated to the insured peril uh, and not with that same originating cause. The court also looked at the market practice of insurers, what happens in practice, and uh, what was particularly useful was the flooding that occurred in the Lake District in 2009 at Cockermouth. And the flooding in that case was such that all of the businesses on the main street had to shut, and the whole street was effectively a building site for a period of six months. Now, if the insurer's arguments were correct, then on in that case, what should have happened is that the uh, the policyholders, insurance, insurers in those cases should have assessed their likely business performance uh, during the indemnity period based on the factual scenario where the flooding had still occurred, but that that particular shop had remained unharmed. And clearly that particular shop remaining unharmed wouldn't really have been able to do any trade because the whole street was flooded and a building site for six months. And actually that's not how the insurers uh, back in 2009 approached uh, that, that incident, they projected the performance of the shops on the basis that the flooding itself hadn't occurred. Um, so that supported the Supreme Court's finding. The Supreme Court also considered the US case law. And interestingly, there was a case called Catlin Syndicate and Imperial Palace of Mississippi, which they looked at, which similarly, similar facts to uh, the Orient Express, albeit uh, the arguments were somewhat reversed because what had happened in that instance was uh, the insured was a casino that had also been damaged by, by Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and the, the hurricane had damaged the surrounding area and had damaged all of the casino's competitors as well. For some reason, the casino, the Imperial Palace was able to get up and running again quicker than everyone else. And they did a roaring trade because they were the only casino open in the area and all their competitors were shut. So they were trying to argue uh, the point that the counterfactual scenario, which has to be considered when applying the trends clauses, is one where the hurricane still occurred, the hurricane still damaged all of their competitors, uh, but that their casino was left unharmed. In that case, they clearly would have done very well. And the court said, we're not going to take that view, we're not going to take that construction, 
because the cause of the damage and the damage itself, so the hurricane and the damage to the casino, they're so intricately, inextricably intertwined that they cannot be separated. And even if they could, it wouldn't be right to allow the windfall profits that the casino was claiming. So all of these matters together supported the Supreme Court's judgment that the right way of construing the trends clause is to consider not just the insured peril, the, the occurrence of COVID-19 within the 25 mile radius, but also the circumstances arising out of the same uh, originating and underlying cause. So that being all of the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. So as a consequence of, of that reasoning, they had to uh, overrule the Orient Express case and decide that it was wrongly decided. Uh, and uh, they did make some excuses for themselves, uh, but uh, they uh, did admit with some humility that it had been wrongly decided. Now, the, the last issue to be considered uh, is the pre-trigger losses. And this is important in, to be considered by the Supreme Court because it was a fairly major concession that had been made by the divisional court to the insurers at first instance. And that was that under the trends clause, the divisional court said that the inquiry as to what the business, business's likely performance would have been during the indemnity period should take into account any measurable downturn in the business's turnover before the cover was triggered. So uh, the Supreme Court used the example of a pub. Now the pub um, suffered a 30% downturn in business uh, before any of the restrictions were imposed. And that was because uh, of the, uh, all the press coverage, the non-binding advice given by the government telling people to stay at home uh, and the pub experienced a 30% reduction in turnover. Now, uh, this pub had the benefit of a prevention of access clause. And the prevention of access clause may not have been triggered until the 20th of March when the pub was told to shut by uh, the prime minister. So uh, the divisional court had said that the pre-trigger losses, so that 30% downturn before the policy had been triggered, uh, could be taken into account when projecting forwards the business's performance in the indemnity period. So that 30% could be assumed, that 30% fall in turnover could be assumed to have continued throughout the indemnity period. So that's a significant reduction in the cover granted to many policyholders. And the Supreme Court wasn't happy uh, with that conclusion. And they actually said it was inconsistent with the divisional court's own finding uh, under the trends causes that the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic had to be stripped out. As I've just mentioned, the Supreme Court came to the same conclusion uh, and required that the trends clause to consider what are the circumstances that arise out of the same underlying and originating, originating cause of the insured peril. And those circumstances have to be disregarded and they have to be disregarded whether they happened after the triggering or before the triggering of the policy. Um, so the pre-trigger losses should not be taken into account when considering what the business's likely performance would have been during the indemnity period. Uh, well, thanks everyone. And I'll hand back to Nick for the Q&A. Thanks, Dan. Um, hi again, everyone. I should have said at the start, actually, that we, we will stick around at the end um, to answer any questions that you've got. And there is in Zoom a Q&A function that I think you can access, it depends on the device you're on, but either at the top or the bottom of your screen, there'll be a Q&A tab. Uh, and if you click on that, you're able to, to pose questions to us. Um, it, Ian Brown did uh, write a question um, 20 minutes or so ago that I've, I've put a short answer to in that function, but I'll expand a little bit on it. Ian asks, in relation to disease clauses, some policies require an occurrence within a one mile radius. And in March, testing was very limited. Would an actual diagnosis of COVID-19 be needed within the radius to engage cover? Or would it be sufficient to argue that on the balance of probabilities, there were occurrences within the radius pointing to numbers of people self-isolating, for example. Um, now, it, you see my answer, the, the Supreme Court um, didn't have to deal with this because the divisional court's ruling on it wasn't challenged, but at paragraph 53 of the Supreme Court decision, they, they set out what the divisional court said. What it said was that uh, in order for um, an illness resulting from COVID-19 to be sustained by any person, in the language of the policy, uh, it's not necessary for the person concerned to have been diagnosed as having the disease, 
and it's not even necessary for them to have manifested any symptoms of illness. So the language of the policy itself doesn't require those things. It is sufficient that they had in fact contracted the disease, whether it had manifested itself or been diagnosed. Now that, that's the, the technical uh, construction of the language of the policy. It obviously doesn't um, resolve the question because you still did, and if they didn't manifest it or weren't diagnosed with it, that could be difficult. So Ian's question is a good one. It, it will turn on the balance of probabilities. I don't think it would be enough to uh, reason that um, people were self-isolating in the area um, or, or that um, you know, people had coughs or things like that. that. That alone is unlikely to be sufficient. It will depend upon where the area is. So um, some areas um, fared very well uh, at the outset of the pandemic. The Scilly Isles is one example that said not to have sustained the case until September last year. And, and some of the more remote um, Hebridean islands of Scotland will, will definitely fall into the same category. So there will be areas where it will be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to overcome that evidential burden uh, and to show um, that the case was in fact there. But it is something that will turn on the balance of probabilities. And, and um, it, it, aside from those truly remote areas in both senses of the word, uh, I suspect it won't be a particularly difficult task for, for most insurers now, um, given that the pandemic had spread far and wide across mainland um, UK by the time our government responded. Um, yeah, there, there, will, there will inevitably be a bit of wrangling about it, but, but I suspect that it, insurers will struggle on the balance of probabilities to show, um, particularly within a 25 mile radius, that there, there wasn't a case here. It might be a little harder within a one mile radius, but. Um, the, the writing is on the wall from the Supreme Court that it's you know, diagnosis isn't, isn't a condition, even symptoms aren't a condition. Uh, and I would have thought it's inherently unlikely, unless you live somewhere very remote, um, that the, the pandemic hadn't, or the virus hadn't made its way there by the time our government acted. Um, sorry if I'm, I'm tapping my screen, I'm looking to see what other questions we've had come in. Um, so uh, Brendan asks, access to premises, does the judgment deal with, say, a professional photographer or similar, where the restrictions have led to cancellation of events rather than the home studio? Uh, so far as I know, it doesn't. Um, the, the, those sorts of examples, I, I can't recall seeing an example like that um, come up anywhere in, in either the Divisional Court's treatment or the Supreme Court's treatment. But the reason is probably that the policies under consideration um, they, uh, I put it, they ensure against interruption to a business conducted from premises, and that's why the clauses have these radius, you know, how these radius provisions can operate. They are a radius around a premises. Um, so the, the, the judgment isn't looking at policies um, that, that, that sit outside that category, for people who don't trade from particular premises and, and operate all over the place. Um, so you, you may have alighted upon a completely separate species of policy that's, that's yet to, um, to come across the court's desk. Um, Rob asks, good morning Rob, uh, my question is that my small business in the hospitality tourism sector has business protection insurance and uh, the insurer AXA has agreed in May last year to compensate me for my losses, but their position currently is that because we've been so successful since reopening on the 4th of July, that the losses we incurred during lockdown one have been mitigated by the increased turnover since, and therefore there is little or no compensation to be paid. My broker is adamant this is sharp practice and that whatever happens after reopening should not affect the level of the claim for loss of earnings while closed down. We are currently at stalemate. Uh, please comment if you feel this is an interesting question. It certainly is an interesting question. It's not, um, you, know, you won't be surprised that we're not dishing out legal advice on particular cases, but I, I, I share your broker's view that that sounds odd. Uh, and legally, the reason I reached that, that sort of instinctive reaction is that these clauses have an indemnity period in them. And it's normally quite short, it's often three months. It's that that the, the, uh, the policy is responding to, the loss is saying within that period. Uh, and that crystallizes necessarily at the end of that period. Um, it, it's right, the law requires you to mitigate losses during the period in which those losses are being sustained. But, but it's generally no answer to say that since then, the loss which is crystallised, the insurer's obligation to pay out for the indemnity in that, say, three-month period, it's no answer to say that that obligation has subsequently been cut down or extinguished because of your success since then. Um, so that I, I can't give you particular advice, and this isn't to be interpreted as that, but I, um, if I were you, I'd be looking to challenge that position. 
Um, Daniel Blaylock asks, uh, Georgie, what was factor D? Um, so Georgie, what was factor D? Sorry, Georgie, you're muted. Still muted. <laughs> Still muted. This is the, uh, the delights of Zoom. All right. I'm not sure what's uh, what's going on with everybody else's ability to mute. I hope I'm not muted, and I've not just been talking to myself in response to everybody else's questions. Dan shaking his head. That's reassuring. Um, well, for some reason or another, nobody but me seems to be able to unmute themselves. So I, I don't know why that is. Um, perhaps, I think I'm uh, fine, Nick. Oh right. Oh, it might be at Georgie's end. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Daniel. I, I I have no idea what factor D is. Um, I'd need Georgie's assistance in answering that, but it may be that she um, she can log back in and it'll work, or, or you can email her and she'll she'll get back to you on it. Um, Brendan asks, what about a policy endorsement specifically excluding cover for any communicable disease, except a list of specified diseases? Uh, <laughs> Difficult to answer in the abstract, but it, it, if there's if there's something in the policy that excludes cover for any communicable disease except a list of specified diseases, it's the list of specified diseases that's likely to trigger cover. If you can't bring it within those, it won't work. Now, often in these policies, among the list of specified diseases is a catch-all of notifiable diseases, and that term bears a particular legal meaning um, uh, in various statutes and statutory instruments. So that in itself that the term notifiable diseases is open to um, admit of um, uh, diseases not yet known at the time the policy was written but which subsequently become notifiable diseases and are captured um, but there, there was and there is an interesting point friend in response to this that in, in the treatment of disease clauses one of the arguments the insurer ran under something called exclusion l was an argument that there was an exclusion uh, uh, an exclusion provision buried i think in page 73 of one of the policies the effect of which, if read literally, was to, to wipe out cover for a whole chunk of um, wildly contagious diseases that, that would otherwise have been captured by the clear wording of the, the, um, the, the disease clause bolt on itself. And the Supreme Court, I think, quite rightly said, look, that's, that would drive a coach and horses through the, the natural meaning of the, the, the primary insuring clause. If you intend to do that, you can't bury it in page 73. You need to make it quite clear, quite prominent, and we'd probably have to put it in the insuring clause itself. Um, which is, I thought, was something reminiscent of Lord Denning's famous big red hand approach. If you want to exclude something so, so um, uh, in such a way as to devastate a huge chunk of cover, you better do it pretty clearly and not bury it in, uh, in, in page 73. Um, I think Georgie might have managed to get back on and unmute herself. Are Hello. you there, Georgie? Oh, sorry, my computer froze as I was trying <laughs> to paste the factors in. So, um, Danielle, in relation to your question, I'm assuming that it was in relation to the causal sequencing, so the process by which causation is narrowed and the, the scope of the indemnity is narrowed through the factors A to D, which were listed. So in answer to your question, factor D was an interruption to the policyholders' activities, which is the sole and direct cause of the loss. And that's essentially the last element in the chain. And what the Supreme Court said was that by applying the but for approach or the approach which the insurers were contending for um, on appeal, um, you essentially strip out those elements and that's not what either party contracted for. So going back to the process of construction and what the parties meant by using words such as um, the occurrence of a notifiable disease, which causes goes on to B, which causes goes on to C, that is essentially um, on, as a matter of construction, what the parties agreed to, and that's how construction uh, causation should be approached. And that, that was the Supreme Court's um, uh, decision on causation in relation to hybrid and uh, prevention of access clauses. So I hope that was what you were asking for. I'm sorry, I couldn't answer it a second ago. I, I was thinking of holding for a sign saying I'm, I'm broken, but it, we're all still <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Georgie. Um, carrying on. Matthew asks, uh, assuming that insurers pay out, is it likely that any furlough monies received will have to be repaid? It's a very good question. Um, I suspect the way that will be taken into account is that the, the most policies insure against um, 
effectively a loss of profit that, that, that's been sustained by virtue of the business interruption. And the, the definition of profit may allow the savings made by furlough to, to be taken into account because you've, you've managed to mitigate um, some of the expenses that the business would otherwise have incurred in employing its staff. You've obviously not managed to, to trade or trade to the same extent, but, but profit is, is the difference between those two those two things. Um, but I, the short answer is I, I don't actually know how that would be treated. It may depend upon the wording of each policy. I don't know, Dan, if you've, if you've any views on that from the quantum end of the court's approach. It wasn't an issue in the Supreme Court, but um, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on it. No, Nick, I think you're right. I think the focus will be on profit. So what what profit have you have you lost as a result uh, has been caused by the pandemic uh, and by the interruption? Um, so I think that that will be the question and uh, the furlough yeah. monies will be factored into that, I would have thought. It's, it's a difficult one because some some it will depend on the wording of the policy and it's some um, I put it when you're when you're determining what uh, what the, the policy responds to and what it indemnifies against. If the word, if the word, if the policy is worded correctly, it can remove the influence or the impact of extraneous events, such as you know, receiving money in these in these forms, or for example, a different policy paying out to mitigate a different element of loss. But the the short answer is it will depend on the wording of each particular policy. But I, I can see scope for for the calculation of profit to um to, to factor in uh, furlough monies that have been received. Um, finally, Cathy asks. What is your view on the ability to claim losses for each loss, i.e. Uh, firstly in lockdown one, secondly during November, and thirdly in current lockdown, i.e. if cover says it ceases when the business interruption ceases? If a business reopened in July or August, would it be prevented on a new claim from the next closures? Again, that, that is really going to turn on each policy. Um, the... As I said earlier, there is an indemnity period in most of these policies, and, and that is um, deliberately uh, uh, curtailed by the insurer so that they can, can limit their exposure. That's part of the bargain struck between the insurer and the policyholder. Um, in all sorts of policies like this, there are usually provisions that provide for um, recurring events or, or how many separate incidences of something can be covered within a a calendar year um, and even then a cap on the total liability that the insurer is liable to pay for, for any combination of different um, different claims under the policy in the same way that you have with you know, for example pet insurance if the dog gets so many illnesses in a year the policy doesn't necessarily, necessarily respond to each one in turn so the, I'm afraid the short answer Kathy, is it will depend entirely on each policy but I suspect that they are very um, or most will be very restrictively worded in a way that will make that quite difficult uh, and of course, um, you know, if policies have lapsed during that, that, that period, insurers will not have been uh, dishing out renewals on anything like as generous a term. So it may well be that most, um, most businesses are going to struggle in the latter lockdowns to, to, to get meaningful cover um, or to get a meaningful result from their insurer. Um, I don't know if anybody else had anything else to add on, on that front. Oh, sorry, I'm seeing more questions coming in. Um, Roger asks, what is the position of the business that didn't have to close, but still suffered a loss of profits because of the pandemic? Perhaps a law firm that was simply less efficient because of home working. This is Georgie's turf. Go for it, Georgie. It's fine. Um, I think it'd probably be easier to type the answer out. I'm in the process of typing it because um, the Supreme Court expressly dealt with this in the judgment. Um, I don't know if you've had access to the judgment, but it's at paragraph 144. And essentially, in terms of uh, the question of an inability to use when they were construing what that meant. Um, the Supreme Court said that it would be difficult for category three and category five businesses. So the businesses that were listed in the 26th of March regulations in the schedule um, to those regulations um, and law firms fall within those, um, I believe it's category five. The Supreme Court said that it would be very difficult for them to demonstrate the requisite inability to use the premises when they weren't necessarily forcibly closed by the restrictions so I'll carry on typing out the answer but in essence um, the position is is not a great one um, unfortunately if you weren't required to close completely by reason of the regulations. Thanks Georgie. Um, sorry if you're getting a bit of background noise from me the dog's decided that I need to, to see the bone that he's chewing to pieces. Um, the last two questions from, from um, an, an anonymous attendee uh, asked in terms of impact on litigation and defending claims based on closures, for example, of wedding venues and customers seeking refunds, uh, 
Is there perhaps any indication where the policies could perhaps respond to the losses of these claims, including if those claims based on contractual sums being recovered? Um, I mean, if a policy is held by a business that operates a wedding venue and its ability to do that is, is interrupted and it has business interruption cover, then it's perfectly possible that that's engaged. If they're unable to um, uh, continue to um, uh, offer their venue for those services and that results in them sustaining losses because customers are entitled to some or all of their money back, then yes, it's perfectly possible it will respond. Um, but again, um, it will depend upon the terms of each policy and it will depend upon the uh, in part the customer's rights to get their money back from the, the, the venue um, and so to cause the venue a loss in that, that, that form. Um, and finally, does the Supreme Court decision only impact those with a wider notifiable disease definition or does it also apply to the notifiable disease definitions that are limited to set diseases? So cover only for notifiable diseases which are defined as a set list which doesn't include COVID-19. Uh, well, if it, it, if cover doesn't include COVID-19, then you're not in business, I'm afraid. Um, the, the policy has to be worded in a manner that, that, that extends to that. Um, as I said earlier, the vast majority use the term notifiable diseases within the language of their policy, and that term um, is liable to change. What, what is a notifiable disease changes over time as diseases are notified or, or as diseases are brought within that classification. Um, but, but if you had a policy that, for example, only said that uh, um, it, it responds to uh, cholera, um, uh, typhoid and uh, the common, the, the, well, anything else that's, that's particularly specific, let's say cholera and typhoid, um, then no, it's not going to respond to this. It, it plainly doesn't extend to it. So I'm afraid you know, you, the, the particular language of the, of the policy wording will be all important there. If it, if it doesn't either expressly refer to um, uh, COVID or respiratory diseases or notifiable diseases as a category, then you won't be in business. Um, I think that brings to an end the, the questions in the Q&A feed. Um, so I will, at that point, thank you all again for, for listening to us all and to my dog, to Van and his bone. I hope it's been of some use to you. Um, uh, from all of us here, thanks very much um, and goodbye. I'll ask Emily to, to do the tech wizardry, bringing it to a close.